In January 2015, a revised standard practices guide for officiating came out, which included a second method of skating as an outside pack ref, called sectional OPR. Even a year later, sectional OPR is still new and being felt out. Therefore, this module is only going to cover the very basics of the process, expected to evolve as time marches on. This module is also going to cover a process in OPR positioning called leapfrogging. Be warned, this is not a best practice, nor is it a standard practice, and some head referees or tournament head referees may tell you not to do it. This is their right. But it's also becoming increasingly common, by myself as well, which is why I'm including it. Both of these practices, when done incorrectly, can cause the outside pack ref rotation to disintegrate and become totally useless. If my original presentation was OPR 101 and 201, then this is a graduate level course. If you are not totally comfortable doing a standard fluid OPR rotation, then do not perform what I'm going to talk about. You won't do yourself or anyone else any favors. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. The date of this recording is November the 28th, 2015, and there have been no updates since the original presentation was recorded. So if I'm so adamant that this is expert level positioning, why am I talking about it? Because people do what they see, especially when they see it at higher level games. When I refed soccer, shirt pulling wasn't a real problem in my games until 2002. Then, almost instantly, in rec level games, it became rampant because they were seeing it all over their TV screens on the Soccer World Cup. Likewise, after Fluid OPR first came out, version 1, if you recall from our first presentation on outside pack ref positioning, everyone ran it. And 9 times out of 10, it was run badly. It's one of the reasons version 2 of Fluid OPR came out, to address the issues that came from people overrunning their laps and failing to return in time. Unfortunately, I've already seen sectional being run both badly and inappropriately. So let's go over what sectional OPR is and when it should be run. On second thought, let's do that in the reverse order. Being I know the guy who initially pushed for sectional to become part of standard practices, I'm pretty confident on the history of it and when it should be used. It came out of the 2014 WFTDA championships when there was a game where the teams playing rarely did a full rotation of the track during a jam. The head ref and OPRs talked and decided to just keep their relative positions on the outside instead of dropping back and resetting. The reasoning behind it was that any OPR dropping off would effectively become useless because they would either have to stop so far back and wait for a pack that would never come or overshoot the return lap so far that there really wasn't any reason for them to drop off in the first place. That's pretty much the reason then, and still is now. But let's backtrack to the fluid outside pack ref rotation. The reason in a fluid or even a skate and weight OPR structure is because since the OPRs have a much longer distance to cover than the skaters during a jam, they would drop off in the back so they could pick up the pack at the front, making sure there is always someone at the front and the back of the pack on the outside at all times. So when should the sectional method be used? When the pack speed is so slow 
that dropping back is actually going to be a hindrance to officiating because of the changes in positioning that need to take place. Or to put it another way, when the pack is so slow that dropping back and resetting seems silly. To possibly go too simplistic, if the pack isn't going to go around the track more than once during a jam, you may want to consider sectional positioning. Conversely, if the pack is going to have multiple trips around the track in a jam, then do not do the sectional. Sectional is designed for a certain type of game and a certain speed of game. Now that we know when, and more importantly, when not to use the sectional, let's talk about what it is. When we talked about the fluid OPR, we talked, among other things, about when to hand off position to avoid bunching up and keeping the entirety of the pack covered on the outside. Sectional is pretty much that, except that there are no handoffs. If you are the front OPR, you stay in the front for the entire jam. If you're in the middle, you're in the middle. In the back, then stay in the back. So far, so simple. Speaking for myself, when Fluid OPR came out, I loved it. Call me crazy, but if I'm not sweating as a referee, I feel like I'm doing it wrong. And Fluid OPR allowed me to sweat a lot. Sectional is a conceit that the pack is not going to move much. So in order to keep sweating, you need to keep moving. And if the pack isn't moving, we can use that lack of movement to ferret out a lot more details that we wouldn't necessarily be able to do in a fast moving pack. For instance, since in a sectional OPR rotation there are always three OPRs on the pack, if a blocker is following out the jammer to the front of the pack and you are the front outside pack ref, follow them. Likewise, if a blocker knocks out an opponent and tries to drop back to force out that out of bounds skater to the back of the pack or to draw a cutting call, you can follow that skater back if you're the rear OPR. If you're the middle outside pack ref, you have a roving eye on the pack, doing a lot of quick shifting depending on who's moving to the outside or not. All of those things you wanted to do when the pack was fast, but you needed to worry about how to catch up or being caught out of position, you can now do. So take advantage of the slow pack speed and do it. So that's all well and good and sounds pretty easy when it comes down to it. But I did say I saw a lot of people doing it wrong at the beginning of this presentation. So what did I see? Primarily two things. One, people in a sectional OPR who don't know how to drop out of the sectional correctly. And two, people trying to force themselves to do the sectional when they can't keep up with the pack speed. The latter is pretty easy to fix. Go into the game assuming you should be doing fluid OPR. If you take nothing else away from this presentation, take this. Fluid OPR, when done correctly, works at every pack speed. Yes, it may seem silly to drop off and reset if the pack is traveling at one mile per hour, but it works. Sectional does not work when the pack is going fast. Fluid outside pack ref in a slow pack is still going to have two OPRs on the pack at all times. Sectional on a fast pack can quickly have zero outside pack refs in position. So seriously, until you know you can do sectional in your game, fluid OPR, fluid OPR, fluid OPR. The first issue is a little tougher to address. Let's say you're skating in a sectional OPR rotation and things are going just fine, but then the pack unexpectedly takes off. What do you do? The answer is fluid OPR. The difference is here, you now need to switch from sectional to fluid on the fly. Hopefully, being the master of fluid OPR that I asked you to be before attempting sectional, you know the drill. The rearmost outside pack ref drops off and peels back in order to pick up the pack at the front. 
We're leaving the other two outside pack refs from trying to catch up with a pack that's both moving faster than they are and have a shorter distance to complete their circuit than they do. The question is, where do you drop off? If you feel comfortable, you can drop off anywhere. But it may be easier to drop off at the standard points of turn two and four, just like you never left the fluid rotation. Once the jam is over, you may want to reconsider returning to the sectional until you're better able to read the game and then decide if the pack will take off again. From experience, this is a lot easier to say than it is to do. To quote someone from the 2015 WFTDA Championships, sorry, I don't remember who said it, the rear outside pack ref needs to have zero ego. Staying in a sectional, no matter what, is not winning the outside pack ref game. Keeping coverage on the outside is winning the outside pack ref game. And that means dropping off for the good of your teammates in stripes. Before sectional became part of standard practices, the league I'm in did a bit of beta testing. And from that, if you want to run sectional, I want to give you a bit of advice. Order your outside pack refs by how fast they are. That way, even if there's just a slight boost in speed, you always have the front and middle covered. A slower skater on the front is more likely to be put out of position if there's a sudden pack speed increase. This isn't an issue with fluid OPR because you can start your run early to meet a fast pack, but sectional, since we don't have a built-in stop and reset point, is much less forgiving. I'm sorry, but it is. There's more leeway between the front and middle OPRs and if everyone's a great skater on the outside, then feel free to go nuts. But I did say this was graduate level stuff. I figured when I started writing this module on sectional, I would touch on the process of leapfrogging. Leapfrogging, light sectional, started out rather spontaneously to address a pretty specific issue. That of blockers knocking the opposing jammer out of bounds at the front of the engagement zone, then tracking to the back in order to either draw a cut or force the jammer to recycle and work her way through the pack yet again. This is frequently referred to as a soul crush. Ideally, this information should be able to be passed down from outside pack ref to outside pack ref to make sure things don't get missed. In practice, this can be difficult. What if the venue is loud? What if there's more than one blocker going backwards, but only one can actually get a cut? Can you reasonably get that information out in time for the other outside pack ref to use? Again, this is not a standard practice, so I'll leave it to those who are involved to make the final determination if that information can be communicated or not. But for purposes of this discussion, we'll assume that answer is no. In this scenario, we'll have a jammer blocked out of bounds. This can be done with blockers as well, but more often than not, a soul crush is attempted on a jammer. And for purposes of diagramming, it's all so much easier. The leapfrogging process is actually pretty simple. Let's assume the block occurs at the front of the engagement zone, although it can also happen in the middle. If it happens at the back, there should be no need to leapfrog. If there is, someone is really out of position. The block happens, the players track back, and the front outside pack ref follows, communicates to the next outside pack ref down to take his place. A one-syllable word like switch works well. The middle outside pack ref then moves up to the front. If the soul crush continues, the outside pack ref following the action can tell the rear OPR to switch into the middle, just as we did with the front. And scene. A couple of notes about this and about following possible cuts to the back in general. Stay with the player that was knocked out of bounds, not the blockers on the track. There are two reasons for this. First, I know some players who will try a quick burst of speed just before their opponent re-enters the track to try to get a quick cut. If there is a quick cut call, following the player who is knocked out of bounds will put you in the best position to see if it's an actual cut or not. 
Second, if you follow the player knocked out of bounds, you're not broadcasting where that player can legally re-enter. I've based the information about leapfrogging based on my own experience with it. As of this recording, I've done a grand total of six games where I was an outside pack ref and did leapfrogging. The last five were at a recent tournament. You may have seen it. And over the course of those five games with the other outside pack refs, we were able to get in a pretty good sync with each other. In this case, we found one other reason to do a leapfrog, which was when one outside pack ref had to chase after a skater to issue a penalty. In this case, the process was a little different. In this example, I'll have the front outside pack ref call a penalty, then have to chase down the skater who missed the call. On seeing that front OPR move backwards, the middle outside pack ref takes the initiative in jumping forward and announcing that he's taken the front position. This allows what was the front outside pack ref to reset almost immediately after the penalty has finally been enforced. Now in the middle. In the 12 years that modern roller derby has been around, there's been a large change in how the game is played with regards to strategy. These changes have necessitated a change in how we officiate it. How long the slow game is going to remain a thing is anyone's guess. But if you watch the 2015 WFTDA championships, you'll notice that there's been an increase of speed versus the last couple of years. There's also been pivot line starts. So I need to emphasize again that the sectional cannot be the end-all be-all for outside pack refing. If you, and more importantly, if the people you are skating with can do it, then more power to you. But don't be afraid to go back to the fluid outside pack ref rotation. I'd like to thank Danforth Johnson and Donna Olmsted for their kind permission to use their photographs in this presentation. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.